here. I am still, oh, oh sorry. I am, that's okay. You're good. I am still recovering um, from COVID. So uh, my voice may not hold out for the entire presentation, um, but I'm going to stop to also allow you all some time to ask questions if you have questions about your specific brand. Uh, so let's dive in and talk about building a personal brand as a freelancer. Um, this is really something that you need to own. And I find that a lot of new and even experienced freelancers, um, they don't really have a clear, cohesive concept for their brand. They're really leaning into the fact that they can do the skills they sell to clients well. That is not enough. And that is not a brand because when a client is shopping around or when the client has been pitched by multiple people at once, they need a way to tell those freelancers apart. And so it's assumed, it's a given that every person who is possible or has the potential to complete a project knows what they're doing. They have the skills. If they're a designer, they know Canva, they know Adobe Photoshop. If they're a writer, they've submitted articles or books or things like that before. That is not branding and it doesn't go far enough to tell a client why you are the right person to be hired. And so you need to be really clear about who your brand is and what you offer to clients because this helps you stand out from your competition. And it has the added bonus of dissuading non-ideal clients from working with you, right? So, um, and I'll talk later about kind of some of my brand words for my content writing business, but part of my brand is very professional. It's somewhat serious. I work with a lot of lawyers. So I'm creating content for people who are going through really difficult legal challenges. So if I was sarcastic and uh, funny with my clients and presented that for my brand, that is a brand mismatch for a lot of my clients. Now that's not to say you can't have a lot of different clients being sarcastic or funny, but it's something to be mindful of. Does your branding and what you bring to the table align with what your clients want? There are some clients out there who are looking specifically for that, but you want to have it kind of nailed down as to what it is that you do and the type of client that you're looking um, to work with. So um, as we talk through this presentation, some keywords may come to mind for you. You're going to think about uh, things past clients have said to you, feedback you've gotten on places like Upwork or Fiverr, and you want those to be consistent across all of your materials. So um, a lot of times when you are um, a new freelancer, you don't have this data yet. You haven't worked with enough clients on projects to be able to say, hey, uh, this is what makes me really unique but start gathering those details. Ask your clients at the end of projects, what did you like about working with me? Sometimes it might be things that you didn't necessarily expect. Uh, sometimes my clients will say, I really liked how you organized the whole process and had me onboarded with a kickoff call. You recorded it, you asked questions, you took notes during the kickoff call. I felt like there was a much better chance that the content I was going to receive was gonna be close to what we were looking for because of that. Before clients started saying things like that to me, I, I took that as a given, like every writer that's especially writing a website and about pages should take that time to get to know their client. Um, but it, it, those are little clues that your clients tell you that you're doing something different or you're doing something better or you're doing something uh, more than the client expected. So once you know what those keywords are that fit into your brand, you can be consistent across all of your marketing materials. And like I said, this helps draw the right clients in and send the right clients or the wrong clients away. So here's a really simple formula for doing some basic branding as a freelancer. And the outcome is to define the transformation that you provide. So it is not about, I write articles, I schedule social media. That is a thing that is a deliverable or that is the basic agreement that you have with a client, but that doesn't tell the client what about you makes the delivery of that service special. So you can plug and play with this. I help people. So for me, it would be, I help lawyers and small law firms accomplish first page rankings on Google through expert SEO knowledge and industry tools. That tells my ideal clients exactly who I am and what I bring to the table for them. And it helps make some distinctions between me and other freelancers. Yes, your clients are hiring you to save them time or to complete a thing but they're hiring you for the results that you provide. What is what you're doing for them going to matter for them? What does it allow them to do? That gets back to your brand. So if you're a virtual assistant, maybe you see your primary um, purpose as saving somebody time. That's true, but you also help people get organized. You help them execute projects on deadline. And so 
those are the kinds of results that clients care about when they are looking to hire a freelancer. So think about that. You know, I help the people I serve accomplish what are the results my work gets for my clients and through what secret sauce or method do I achieve those results? And a lot of times you'll have this information from your past clients. They'll say, you're organized. You used innovative ideas that I've never heard before. Uh, you took the time to really get to know me. Those are things that factor into your secret sauce. So here's another example. Uh, I help human resources departments streamline their recruiting, hiring, and retention through customized training. That is a really quick, clear sentence that you could say to somebody in an elevator, somebody you're meeting for the first time at a conference, as if a, you get on a call with a client and they're like, so tell me more about you, right? We all hate that question because it's like, what do you mean? Are you asking me about my business, my personal life, a mixture of both? This is the kind of quick sentence that you can bring out. And then you can lead into some of that more personal stuff, like how long you've been doing it, what drew you to human resources and things like that. So a lot of times what factors into your secret sauce is your unique value proposition. This is what you do differently or do better than a lot of your competition. There are many ways that you can stand out with a, a value proposition. It could be the level of detail or focus. Maybe you're an extremely organized person. You love digging into the details. What better quality would you want in a proofreader, an editor, a podcast manager, a social media manager, things where those little details can make a big difference. Maybe you have a specific expertise in your particular industry, even if it's outside of freelancing. So let's say you worked in financial services for five years before going off on your own and becoming a freelance CPA. You have a lot of industry experience that you're bringing that knowledge and best practices from your day job and then also everything that you've learned being a freelancer as well. So don't write off that other industry expertise. And even if you don't have industry expertise, you may have some other soft skills that you can bring over into the freelance world. So do you have great communication skills because you used to be a teacher and you had to be able to talk to administrators and parents and kids all within the same day and adjust your tone and the words you're using for those different audiences? So start thinking about unique ways, like how does this pull into your branding and what you do differently for clients? Okay, so you may have a niche focus on this industry or project type. I lean into this one a lot. I've been working with attorneys for 10 years. So I, I mention that in almost every pitch I send and every proposal and call that I do, I have been working with this particular set of people. I know your challenges. I know the outcomes you want. Um, it really kind of helps give me an edge. Even sometimes when I am up against people who have Juris Doctorates, uh, when I'm up against people who are freelancing on the side as, and they have other, they have more legal industry expertise than me. I've kind of combined that and said, hey, I, I have all this freelance experience, but I've been doing it for this specific audience. So that's another way to break it down. Uh, this one is kind of like, I go back, I don't like to offer guarantees to my clients, but some people do. So a great guarantee would be, let's say you're a website designer, you're not guaranteeing that the website's going to perform at a certain speed, but you might guarantee, hey, if you give me everything I need, this website will be live in two months. That gives your clients some peace of mind that you know what you're doing and that there's going to be a consequence if you fall behind for your own reason. It also sets them up to say, hey, there's part of this project that you have to do too in order for us to be successful. You have to give me everything I need. So guarantees can be structured in a couple of different ways. I guarantee that my content is 100% original. It will never be duplicated, plagiarized, or stolen from someone else's work. And that makes my clients feel comfortable that the content they get is completely unique and original, and it can go right up on their website or in their marketing materials. If you have specific industry certifications, <clears throat> those are another great way to market yourself with a unique value proposition. A good example is if you're a freelance project manager and you are a certified PMP or you are a Facebook ads manager and you have gone through Facebook's training and gotten the certificates uh, from that saying that you really know what you're doing with Facebook ads, those can be ways to stand out in your branding as well. Um, you can also stand out with any bonuses that you roll in. So is there something extra you're going to do as part of the project that's going to make it easier for the client, going to make the results better? I do a lot of blog writing, but my clients often want images to go along with those blogs. So it's very cheap for me to have a membership to a stock photo site. And I provide that comprehensive service. I give them the 
blog, I download the picture for them. I save it with the right alt tags for SEO and deliver it back to them. I charge more for that than for a client who doesn't need it, but it's something that takes maybe five minutes for me to do. And it makes my client's purpose and end result easier because then they can just upload everything on their site or they pay me to upload it for them. So I want you to start thinking about what are your three brand keywords? What have other clients said about you? If you've worked with other freelancers on projects, what have they said about you? For example, mine are professional to the point and servant leader. Um, that in a handful of words tells my clients who I am as a person and the approach that I bring to every project. You know, I always want my clients to know that I know what I'm doing. This is going to get done on budget. It's going to get done on time. You're going to have a good experience because I'm professional. I'm not going to recommend things that you don't need. If you try to tell me to go a different direction that I don't think will work for you, I'm going to be honest and tell you that I don't think it'll work. And my whole mission behind growing my business is to be a servant, servant leader, to be able to give back to other people. So that helps attract other people building their business in the same way as me. So maybe my, uh, my ideal client is not the person who would say something other than servant leader. Maybe that's something that is a disconnect where I'm going to have a more difficult time writing their brand story if we're not on the same page about that. And by being really clear about my branding, that tells clients out there, oh, Laura is the right fit for me. And then build all of your content marketing around your brand. So here's a good example. The blogs that I write on my website and on LinkedIn for my clients, they focus on things like professionalism, honesty. They may not come out directly and say that, but I talk about like, what are the top five things that can go wrong when you hire a bad legal writer? Um, how much should you expect to pay for a good legal writer? Uh, how to do a test job with a legal writer. These are all getting at the things that are part of my core brand, professional, honest, upfront, and servant leader. <clears throat> I also like this idea of creating brand guidelines for yourself. These are not things you necessarily need to share with your client, but they can be really helpful when you're on a sales call or have a potential project and you realize that it's not in alignment with what you want to stand for. So what kinds of things do you stand for? Are there any things you don't tolerate in your brand? Um, this can really help you determine, do you want to work with a particular client or not? So when I was an employee, one of my biggest brand guidelines as an employee was I was always going to stand up for the employees I managed. If they were burned out, if they were overwhelmed, if they felt like they could not take paid time off, it was part of my brand guideline to be willing to say, I'll take the, I'll take the hit for that. I'm going to go in and bring that up to the entire leadership team that you all are saying this and that it's a legitimate concern. And as a business owner, I don't tolerate working with um, people or promoting the businesses of people who are rude or difficult. Um, it's not in alignment with the way that I want to grow my brand. It's not how I want to spend my time as a freelancer. And so, like I said, you don't need to come out and say to your clients, your potential clients, I don't work with rude people or I don't work with people who don't respect my expertise. But you can talk about it in a more positive light, you know, about how you enjoy working with people who love what they do and are interested in your opinion and insight. That's a way to kind of flip it on its head. So those things can come up in your brand guidelines. It's also really important to build trust with potential clients in your branding. The number one best way to do this is social proof from past clients. Even if you cannot say who the clients are um, because of an NDA or it's feedback on Upwork and the person's name is you know, not a full name or it just says the, a random company name, Use that social proof throughout your branding. You know, I, one way that I've done this is I talk about my average client retention rate. How long does the typical client who bring me on retainer stay with me? It's over two years. That goes into my marketing material because I want my potential clients to know I'm looking for a long-term partner. My brand is a long-term partner for your business. So if you're looking for someone to just do a quick one-off project, that may not be me and that's okay because I'm going to hold that space for someone who is the right fit. Social proof is really powerful, um, especially when you're new as a freelancer or especially when you're breaking off of platforms like Upwork to do your own marketing um, because it can help show that other people have worked with you and have had a really good experience. Also explain your process and what makes it unique. So one way that I do this is I talk about how I like to do kickoff calls with my clients, even if they're only 20 minutes. It is a recorded Zoom call with a shared Google Doc and I am taking notes the entire time. I get that meeting transcribed so that I can review everything that was said. 
Um, a lot of writers won't do that. <clears throat> Excuse me one second here. So talk about your process. And yes, these things go in your brand. Your brand is so much more than just your colors and your logo. All of these things are actually much more important than your colors or your logo. You want colors and a logo that look professional, but if you don't have these other elements to back up your brand, clients do not care. You can have a $5,000 logo and it looks very professional, but if you don't have social proof, if you don't have a unique value proposition, if you don't have what makes you the right person for their job because of the results that you get, it's easy for them to overlook those things. And that just leads to a cycle of frustration for you if you spend a lot of time or money on those literal brand elements like your logo. Bonus points, if you can explain your process by making it visual. One of the best ways I've seen this done is I just wrapped up a total redesign of my own website. On the proposal call with the designer and the team that I ended up hiring, they had a timeline and it showed staggered dates, just like a software company would do product development and product marketing, showing what would be due at each time. In this month, Laura is writing the content. And at the same time, they're doing the JPEG mockups of the site. And the next month, they're putting all of that content on the site. And it's my job to then give them feedback about what I do or don't like. And at the same time, my business manager is giving him, uh, feedback on photos they've chosen for the site. So by making this a visual, I could easily see how my website was going to get done in three months. I knew what was going to be asked of me in terms of time. And this really made it extremely clear. So even when I'm writing a basic proposal for somebody, I try to explain what the process is going to look like. I'll break it down into weeks or milestones, or if it's a huge project, I really like making it a visual. We talked about this a little bit already, but offering guarantees is another way to build trust. It can be as simple as, I'm, I guarantee that I'm going to meet the deadline that we've set so long as you give me everything that I need. So while you're working as a freelancer, there are some other ways to be the expert and to build these things back into your brand. Celebrate results. When clients get a good result, when you finish a project, when they're happy with what you do, celebrate that. Call out others on the team who have done an awesome job. Your brand is also about the legacy and the memories you leave behind with this client. It may be a one and done job where you might never hear from this client again. But I have had clients who did not even pick me for their project refer me to colleagues that showed up two and three years later. So my goal is I always want to leave every project with that client having a great experience so that if they need something else again, they'll come back to me. Or if they meet somebody else who has a similar project, they're going to be happy to say, oh, you need to call Laura. Laura is the best person for this job. So call out others who have done a great job. I have a client right now who is exceptionally organized with the notes he's written for his website rewrite. He said, use these words. Do not use these words. This is what I hate about my current website. This is how I'm different from my competitors. So I called that out right away and said, you're more organized than 95% of my clients. This makes my job faster. It makes my job easier. That impacts your quote. That means we're going to get your website content up and live on time. Um, so lean into learning opportunities too. It's okay to be wrong or it's okay to learn things from other people on the team. You can learn a lot from other people on the team of your clients about how they do marketing, how they do project management, how they communicate. Uh, so you can take away those lessons and build that back into your brand. This also goes into what if you get bad feedback, right? Sometimes the social proof we receive isn't great. Sometimes it's, I wish you would have communicated more or this project felt a little disorganized and I didn't know what was going on at certain times. Use that as an opportunity to ask those questions and build the systems into your business to make it a better experience with your brand the next time around. Uh, admit when you screw up, if you make a mistake, you miss a deadline, you overlook the details of something, admit it and then create an action plan going forward. These things do not derail the entire impression of your brand. They can if you make multiple mistakes or if the entire project is a mess. But if something happens along the way and you say, hey, I didn't anticipate that would be a problem. I have another client whose website was hacked two days before we were about to push it live. That is not a problem that I foresaw. It wasn't my fault, but we had to be able to pivot quickly and create an action plan around that. So going back to my brand guidelines, honest and to the point, can we fix this? How do we fix this? What does it look like? Professionalism. I'm not going to panic. I'm going to say, okay, your website got hacked. Let's not only fix it and get your website live, but let's figure out what security protocols we're missing so we can do a better job next time. 
So does anyone have any questions about building their specific brand as a freelancer? I'm happy to answer those. Laura, I'd love to have you talk a little bit about, I know you know we launched the uh, Capital Quotient and part of the way that we as Numina see using that is in a personal branding um, way because uh, you know it, it's a little bit of effort to go through and then there's some takeaways there. What is your take on using something like the CQ to um, differentiate yourself and kind of add that to your personal branding? Okay, there we go. Um, I think it's really important that you stop and take assessments and figure out what kind of business owner you are. And I think that this new tool, the CQ, can really help with that. It asks some really interesting questions around like, how would you invest in certain scenarios? And it's probably something you haven't thought about a lot as a business owner, but I find tools like that really helpful, especially if you're the kind of person who likes things like the Enneagram or Myers-Briggs or Clifton Strengths. Like, what can you learn more about your approach to business that can help you thrive and lean into your strengths? And how do you bring that back up for your clients as well? So I think it's really helpful to see like, how are you running your business right now? How does that fit with your personality? Are there things you maybe need to change about running your business? I think these kinds of assessments are important because we have to step back and say, hey, what, what do I think I'm projecting? And then what am I actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis? And that's very similar to when you wrap up a project and you think a client's going to say one thing like, oh, it was so organized to work with you. And instead they're like, we just loved that you were so on the ball as an expert. So sometimes that's where we get those additional clues and things to build back into our brand when we're hearing things from an assessment or from a client that can help us really pinpoint what does my brand stand for. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I also have a couple questions too. Um, so you were mentioning something about the importance of soft skills too. What would your, what's your definition of, of a soft skill or something that you think are good, good ones to have as a freelancer? I think for freelancers, communication, project management, organization, um, problem solving ability. These are some of the best ones as freelancers. And like I said, your clients don't really care that much about maybe what you did prior to being a freelancer. I think a lot of times we get in our own heads and we're like, I'm new to this. This is the first time I've been a virtual assistant. That may be true, but you've probably done something in a past job that involved collecting a lot of information, synthesizing it, producing it, getting it to the right people, making sure details were not overlooked. So that's something I really recommend doing when you're thinking about those soft skills. What do you have in your freelance arsenal, but also from school, from volunteer opportunities, from other things you've done in your life? What do you pull in that's a soft skill that really benefits your clients? And um, clients really love those as well, because at the end of the day, like I mentioned at the beginning, they assume that every freelancer has the basic ability to do the job. There may be variations in the quality of the work, but they, they assume that if you're a website designer, you know how to design websites. If you're a voiceover artist, you know what recording equipment to use. But when you can lean into some of those soft skills and talk about what, how that bridges over into your freelance work, they feel a little more confident in hiring you. Yo, that, that sounds good. Yeah. And also I was going to say, like, I really liked what you said about how it's okay that you're wrong sometimes, that you can learn from your mistakes, and that your clients that you, or the people that you work with can teach you how to become a better freelancer and like, you know, tighten up your brand. Um, was there like a specific experience that you had where you feel like you were wrong, but then that made you better at your job? Yeah, I think that one thing that drives clients crazy is when you can't be honest about making a mistake. We all make mistakes, especially if you work with clients on really big projects or for a really long time, it's just the law of like, it's, it's statistics. It's going to happen. You're going to make a mistake sometime. So just own up to it and be honest about it. I've definitely made mistakes with clients um, just a couple of months ago. I don't know if anyone, I've actually complained about this in freelance writer groups. The Grammarly add-in uh, Chrome extension has been a nightmare to work with. And so I assumed it was running and I didn't see that it, for whatever reason, didn't load in my Google Doc. So I submitted an article that had four typos in it to my client. No excuse for that. 100% comes back on me. So I had to say, all right, let me apologize. Let me fix this, right? Let me figure out what damage control I need to do. And then let me figure out 
what additional protocols can I put into place to prevent something like this from happening again? So it's totally okay to be wrong and just own up to that. And I think clients like hearing that too. Hey, I'm really sorry I submitted an article with typos. There's no excuse for that. Something went wrong with my software. Here's the system I've built to prevent that happening again. And again, I'm really sorry. It's a great way to handle it. Oh yeah, thank you so much. That was so helpful. Um, does anyone else have any other questions for Laura? Somebody hear me? Yes, it's real light, yeah. but we can hear you. Okay. So, uh, what do you can recommend to achieve your first client? Because I'm just starting freelance. I worked uh, six plus years to the one company, and like two years uh, I was uh, at remote position, the same company, but now it's uh, sold to another owner, and I uh, want to move to the freelance. What do you can recommend to achieve the first client? Yeah, I think you need to pull every experience that you've had at your previous jobs and talk about why that makes you a good freelancer. And you can even say something as simple as, although I am new to freelancing, I have been executing projects like this for X years with a company in the blah, blah, blah space, whatever it might be. Um, that's actually how I got started is I talked about, you know, I've, I've worked in law firms before. That was really my only experience. Um, and so pull over that additional experience. Like, what are those soft skills? What are the hard skills you can pull over from your job? And just say, although I'm new to freelancing, this is why I feel confident I can complete your project because I've completed projects like this X many times before with teams of 15 people before. Um, I've received awards for the work that I've done at my previous company. So that's a nice way to build that bridge and say, yeah, I'm, I'm new, I'm kind of untested because I don't have this established presence as a freelancer, but I'm choosing to freelance because I was really good at my job. And now I wanna be able to do it for people on terms that I define. So that's what I would recommend. Um, I'd also um, think really carefully about the samples that you're using, which samples are not relevant for every single freelancer, but um, a sample even for somebody that does like IT work or uh, project management can be talking about results. If you are a graphic designer, a writer, things like that, you want to have actual samples of your work. They need to align really closely to the kind of work that you would complete for a client. Clients can overlook you being new if you have really great work. So if you don't have those physical examples, you can talk about, say, for a project manager, hey, I recently helped um, launch an entirely new SaaS product in six months with a team of 17 different stakeholders on a limited budget with a lot of curveballs that were thrown at us because of the global supply chain. So that's a great example of something you did and how it can come over into the world of freelancing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions for Laura? Okay, so I think that concludes our session. And thank you so much, Laura, for all the advice. It was so helpful. And thank you everyone for attending. I'm just gonna stop Thanks. recording now.